Recording by Paul Michael, 1084. Anderson's Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Anderson. The Fir Tree. Out in the woods stood a nice little fir tree. The place he had was a very good one. The sun shone on him. As to the fresh air, there was enough of that. And round him grew many large-sized comrades, pines as well as firs. But the little fir wanted so very much to be a grown-up tree. He did not think of the warm sun and of the fresh air. He did not care for the little cottage children that ran about and prattled when they were in the woods looking for wild strawberries. The children often came with a whole pitcher full of berries, or with a long row of them threaded onto a straw, and sat down near the young tree and said, Oh, how pretty he is! What a nice little fir! But this was what the tree could not bear to hear. At the end of the year he had shot up a good deal, and after another year he was another long bit taller, for with fir trees one can always tell by the shoots how many years old they are. Oh, were I but such a tall high tree as the others are, sighed he, then I should be able to spread out my branches and with the tops to look out into the whole world. Then the birds would build nests among my branches, and when there was a breeze I could bend with as much stateliness as the others. Neither the sunbeams, nor the birds, nor the red clouds, which morning and evening sailed above him, gave the little tree any pleasure. In winter, when the snow lay glittering on the ground, a hare would often come leaping along and jump right over the little tree. Oh, that made him so angry. But two winters were past, and in the third the tree was so large that the hare was obliged to go around it. To grow and grow, to get taller and be tall, thought the tree. That, after all, is the most delightful thing in the world. In the autumn the woodcutters always came and felled some of the largest trees. This happened every year, and the young fir tree, that had now grown to a very comely size, trembled at the sight, for the magnificent trees fell to earth with noise and cracking. The branches were lopped off, and the trees looked long and bare. They were hardly to be recognised. Then they were laid in carts, and horses dragged them out of the wood. Where did they go? What became of them? In spring, when the swallows and the storks came, the tree asked them, Don't you know where they have been taken? Have you not met them anywhere? The swallows did not know anything about it, but the stork looked musing, nodding his head, and said, Yes, I think I know. I met many ships when I was flying hither from Egypt. On the ships were magnificent masts, and I ventured to assert that it was they that smelt of fur. I may congratulate you, for they lifted themselves on high most magnificently. Oh, were I but old enough to fly across the sea? But how does the sea look in reality? What is it like? That would take a long time to explain, said the stork, and with these words off he went. Rejoice in thy growth, said the sunbeams, rejoice in thy vigorous growth, and in the fresh life that moveth within thee. And the wind kissed the tree, and the dew wept tears over him, but the fir understood it not. When Christmas came, quite young trees were cut down, trees which were often not as large or of the same age as the fir tree, who could never rest, but always wanted to be off. These young trees, and they were always the finest looking, retained their branches. They were laid on carts, and horses drew them out of the wood. Where are they going to? asked the fir. They are not taller than I. There was one indeed that was considerably shorter. And why did they retain all their branches? Whither are they taken? We know, we know, chirped the sparrows. We have peered in at the windows of the town below. We know whither they are taken. The greatest splendour and the greatest magnificence one can imagine await them. We peeped through the windows, and we saw them planted in the middle of a warm room and ornamented with the most splendid things, with gilded apples, with gingerbread, with toys, and many hundred lights. And then, asked the fir tree, trembling in every bough, and then, what happens then? We did not see anything more. It was incomparably beautiful. I would not fain know if I am destined for such a glorious career, cried the tree, rejoicing. That is still better than to come across the sea. What a longing I do suffer. Were Christmas but come, I am now tall and my branches spread like the others that were carried off, off last year. Oh, were I already on the cart, were I in a warm room with all the splendour and magnificence. Yes, then something better, something still grander will surely follow, or wherefore should they thus ornament me? Something better, something still grander must follow. But what? Oh, how I long, how I suffer. I do not know myself what is the matter with me. Rejoice in our presence, said the air and the sunlight. Rejoice in thy own fresh youth. But the tree did not rejoice at all. He grew and grew, and was green both winter and summer. People saw him and said, What a fine tree! And towards Christmas he was one of the first that was cut down. The axe struck deep into his very pit. The tree fell to the earth with a sigh. He felt a pang. It was like a swoon. He could not think of happiness, for he was sorrowful at being separated from his home, from the place where he had sprung up. He well knew that he should never see his dear old comrades, 
the little bushes and the flowers around him any more, perhaps not even the birds. The departure was not at all agreeable. The tree only came to himself when he was unloaded in a courtyard with other trees, and heard a man say, That one is splendid, we don't want the others. Then two servants came in rich livery, and carried the fir tree into a large and splendid drawing room. Portraits were hung on the walls, and near the white porcelain stove stood two large Chinese vases with lions on the covers. There, too, were large easy chairs, silken sofas, large tables full of picture books and full of toys, with hundreds and hundreds of crowns, or at least the children said so. And the fir tree was stuck upright in a cask that was filled with sand, but no one could see it was a cask, for green cloth was hung all around it, and it stood on a large gaily coloured carpet. Oh, how the tree quivered! What was to happen? The servants, as well as the young ladies, decorated it. On one branch there hung little nets cut out of coloured paper, and each net was filled with sugar plums, and among the other boughs gilded apples and walnuts were suspended, looking as though they had grown there, and little blue and white tapers were placed amongst the leaves. Dolls that looked for all the world like men, the tree had never beheld such before, were seen among the foliage, and at the very top a large star of gold tinsel was fixed. It was really splendid, beyond description splendid. This evening, they all said, how it will shine this evening. Oh, thought the tree, if the evening were but come, if the tapers were but lighted, and then I would wonder what will happen. Perhaps the other trees from the forest will come to look at me. Perhaps the sparrows will beat against the window panes. I wonder if I shall take root here, and winter and summer stand covered with ornaments. He knew very much about the matter, but he was so impatient that for sheer longing he got a pain in his back, and this with trees is the same as a headache is with us. The candles were now lighted. What brightness, what splendour! The tree trembled so in every bough that one of the tapers set fire to the foliage. It blazed up famously. Help! Help! cried the young ladies, and they quickly put out the fire. Now the tree did not even dare tremble. What a state he was in! He was so uneasy lest he should lose something of his splendour that he was quite bewildered amidst the glare and the brightness, when suddenly both folding doors opened and a troop of children rushed in as if they would upset the tree. The older persons followed quietly, the little ones stood quite still, but it was only for a moment. Then they shouted that the whole place re-echoed with their rejoicing. They danced around the tree, and one present after another was pulled off. What are they about, thought the tree? What is to happen now? And the lights burned down to the very branches, and as they burned down they were put out one after the other, and then the children had permission to plunder the tree. So they fell upon it with such violence that all the branches cracked. If it had not been firmly fixed in the ground it would certainly have tumbled down. The children danced about with their beautiful playthings. No one looked at the tree except the old nurse, who peeped between the branches, but it was only to see if there was a fig or an apple left that had been forgotten. A story! A story! cried the children, drawing the little fat man towards the tree. He seated himself under it, and said, Now we are in the shade, and the tree can listen too, but I shall tell only one story. Now which will you have? That about Evadi Evadi, or about Humpty Dumpty, who tumbled down the stairs, and yet after all came to the throne and married the princess. Avedi, Avedi, cried some. Humpty Dumpty, cried others. But there was such a bawling and screaming, the fir tree alone was silent, and he thought to himself, Am I not to bawl with the rest? Am I to do nothing whatsoever? For he was one of the company, and he had done what he had to do. And the man told about Humpty Dumpty, that tumbled down, who notwithstanding came to the throne, and at last married the princess. And the children clapped their hands and cried, Oh, go on, do go on. They wanted to hear about Avedi, Avedi too. But the little man only told them about Humpty Dumpty. The fir tree stood quite still and absorbed in thought. Birds in the woods had never related the likes of this. Humpty Dumpty fell downstairs, and yet he married the princess. Yes, yes, that is the way of the world, thought the fir tree, and believed it all, because the man who told the story was so good-looking. Well, well, who knows? Perhaps I may fall downstairs too and get a princess for a wife. And he looked forward with joy to the morrow, when he hoped to be decked out again in lights, playthings, fruit and tinsel. I won't tremble tomorrow, thought the fir tree. I will enjoy to the full of all my splendour. Tomorrow I shall hear again the story of Humpty Dumpty, and perhaps that of Evadi Evadi too. In the morning the servant and the housemaid came in. Now then the splendour will begin again, thought the fir tree. But they dragged him out of the room, and up the stairs into the loft. And here, in a dark corner, where no daylight could enter, they left him. What's the meaning of this, thought the tree? What am I to do here? What shall I hear now, I wonder? And he leaned against a wall, lost in reverie. Time enough had he too for his reflections, for days and nights passed on, and nobody came up, and when at last someone did, it was only to put some great trunks in a corner out of the way. There stood the tree, quite hidden. It seemed as if he had been entirely forgotten. "'Tis now winter out of doors,' thought the tree. The earth is hard and covered with snow, 
Men cannot plant me now, and therefore I have been put up here in shelter till springtime comes. How kind man is, after all, if it only were not so dark up here, and so terribly lonely, not even a hare. Out in the woods it was so pleasant when the snow was on the ground, and the hare leaped by, yes, even when he jumped over me. But I did not like it then. It really is terribly lonely here. Squeak, squeak, said a little mouse, at the same moment, peeping out of his hole. And then another one came. They sniffed about the fir tree and rustled among the branches. It is dreadfully cold, said the mouse, but for that it would be delightful here, old fir, wouldn't it? I am by no means old, said the fir tree. There's many a one considerably older than I am. Where do you come from, asked the mice, and what can you do? They were extremely curious. Tell us about the most beautiful spot on earth. Have you ever been there? Were you even in the larder, where cheeses lie on shelves, where ham hangs from above, where one dances about on tallow candles, the place where one enters lean and comes out fat and portly? I know no such place, said the tree, but I know the wood, where the sun shines, and where the little birds sing. And then he told all about his youth, and the little mice had never heard the like before, and they listened and said, Well, to be sure, how much have you seen? How happy you must have been. I, said the fir tree, thinking over what he himself had related, Yes, in reality, those were happy times. And then he told about Christmas Eve, when he was decked out with cakes and candles. Oh, said the little mice, how fortunate you have been, old fir tree. I am by no means old, said he. I came from the wood this winter, I am in my prime, and I am only rather short for my age. What delightful stories you know, said the mice. And the next night they came with four other little mice, who were to hear what the tree recounted. The more he related, the more he remembered himself, and it appeared as if those times had really been happy times. They may still come. Humpty Dumpty fell downstairs, and yet he got a princess, and he thought at that moment of a nice little birch tree growing out in the woods. To the fir, that would have been a real charming princess. Who is Humpty Dumpty? asked the mice. So then the fir tree told the whole fairy tale, for he could remember every single word of it, and the little mice jumped for joy at the very top of the tree. Next night, two more mice came, and on Sunday, two rats even, but they said the stories were not interesting, which vexed the little mice, and they too now began to think them not so very amusing either. Do you know only one story? asked the rats. Only that one, answered the tree. I heard it on my happiest evening, but I did not then know how happy I was. It is a very stupid story. Don't you know the one about bacon and tallow candles? Can't you tell any larder stories? No, said the tree. Then goodbye, said the rats, and they went home. At last the little mice stayed away also, and the tree sighed. After all, it was very pleasant when the sleek little mice ran about me and listened to what I told them. Now that too is over. But I will take good care to enjoy myself when I am brought out again. But when was that to be? Why, one morning there came a quantity of people and set to work in the loft. The trunks were moved, the tree was pulled out and thrown, rather hard, it is true, down on the floor. But a man drew him towards the stairs where the daylight shone. Now a merry life will begin again, thought the tree. He felt the fresh air, the first sunbeam, and now he was out in the courtyard. All passed so quickly, there was so much going on, the tree quite forgot to look at himself. The court adjoined a garden, and all was in flower. The roses hung so fresh and odorous over a balustrade. The lindens were in blossom, the swallows flew by, and said, Queer V, my husband is come. But it was not the fir tree that they meant. Now then I shall really enjoy my life, said he, exultingly, and spread out his branches. But alas, they were all withered and yellow. It was in a corner that he lay, among weeds and nettles. The golden star of tinsel was still on top of the tree, and glittered in the sunshine. In the courtyard some of the merry children were playing who had danced at Christmas round the fir tree, and were so glad at the sight of him. One of the youngest ran and tore off the golden star. Only look what is still on the ugly old Christmas tree, said he, trampling on the branches so that they cracked beneath his feet. And the tree beheld the beauty of the flowers and the freshness of the garden. He beheld himself and wished he had remained in the dark corner of his loft. He thought of his first youth in the wood, of the merry Christmas Eve, and of the little mice who had listened with so much pleasure to the story of Humpty Dumpty. "'Tis over, tis past," said the poor tree. "'Had I rejoiced when I had reason to do so. "'But now tis past, tis past.' And the gardener's boy chopped the tree into small pieces. There were a whole heap lying there. The wood flamed up splendidly under a large brewing copper, and it sighed so deeply. Each sigh was like a shock. The boys played about in the court, and the youngest wore the golden star on his breast which the tree had had on the happiest evening of his life. However, that was over now. The tree gone, the story at an end. All, all was over. Every tale must end at last. End of chapter 5 Recording by Paul Michael, 1084